fortunate to have Harvard's foremost, ex foremost expert on dignity here. Uh, Donna Hicks, who's an associate at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. Uh, speaking next, she has been involved in numerous unofficial diplomatic conflict resolution efforts, including projects in the Middle East, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Colombia, Cuba, and North Ireland, Northern Ireland. She was a consultant to the BCC, to the BBC, where she facilitated a television series, Facing the Truth, with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, which aired in the United Kingdom and on BBC World. She has taught conflict resolution at Harvard, Clark, and Columbia Universities, and conducts training seminars in the Dignity Model, a human-centered approach to rebuilding conflict relationships in the US and abroad. She's the author of the book, Dignity, Its Essential Role in Resolving Conflict, published in 2011 by Yale University Press, and is the founder of DeclareDignity.com. So Dr. Hicks, uh, what exactly are we learning about human dignity that can inform in very concrete ways the development of trust in ethically healthy organizations uh, in ways that might be consonant with humanistic management, as Dr. Pearson describes it? Yes, thank you, Bill. First, it's, uh, I feel privileged to be on this panel with, um, with all of my colleagues. And I think I'm going to take a slightly different tack than what, what they have, because I consider myself a scholar practitioner. And I'm going to emphasize more my practitioner um, understanding and my practitioner role today. So I'm, I'm going to start by just by way of background explaining, as uh, Bill mentioned, I've been working for the last 25 years in international conflict and was, um, had been bringing parties together for dialogues for, um, in order to try to resolve the political issues that divided them. But while I was... Uh, sitting there at these tables as a third party trying to get them to come to some agreement about how to resolve these, these, these differences. What I realized, uh, largely because I'm a psychologist, is that there was another kind of conversation that was taking place at the table, uh, but it wasn't about the political issues that divided them. And no matter where I was in the world, this uh, other dimension of the conflict was popping up. And just because I have so little time, I'm not going to uh, go into much detail about it. But let me just say that it was a profoundly emotional dimension that was never, ever being discussed um, at the table. But in my view, it was running the, running the conversation. And so just the short story is this, this emotional con conversation, if I were to put words to it, it would say some, they would be saying something like, how dare you treat us this way, right? Don't you see we're human beings? Can't you see that when you treat us as if we're second-class citizens or if we're less than, that it affects us? Can't you see we're suffering? And so, very long story short, it took me a while, but I figured out that this was all about their dignity and how they were being treated by the other side. And I think this is the, 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 the really important aspect of dignity that I'm going to focus on here, is that it's about the relationship, about how, it's not so much about how individuals, what their needs are, but what is the nature of the relationship between people that either makes us feel great, makes us feel like we're being seen, being heard, being responded to, versus makes us feel small and diminished and degraded and less than. So, I'm um, going to quickly tell you what my definition of dignity is, because I think this is part of the, part of the problem here, is that we don't really have a, uh, a really strong definition. But after researching this topic now for you know, almost two decades, I've come up with a very simple definition. And I think Michael will appreciate this, because I realized when we're talking about highly charged emotional events like dignity, the simpler the better. Because the brain that gets engaged when we think about our dignity and think about our self-worth is not the sort of executive analytical brain. This, these issues of dignity are really deep in our souls. And it requires very simple uh, words and very simple um, ways of, of explaining it. And so for me, the, very, um, the one thing that, we are, that dignity really highlights is the fact that we're all born inherently worthy. Every single one of us, no matter where we're from, uh, we are all born worthy and valuable. 
Now, that's easy enough to imagine, but the second half of the, the definition, I think, is the more important one for us here. Dignity is about the, our, our vulnerability as well. Human beings, this is what we're learning about what it means to be human, um, that uh, is so central to dignity, that human beings, we're, while we're born equally valuable and worthy, we are also born vulnerable to having that dignity violated. And this is where all the problems um, occur. And what I realized was that this, this desire, this yearning to be treated with dignity was universal. Everybody, no matter where I was in the world, everybody was clamoring for the same thing. Treat me as a human being of value and worth. And um, there's, so, I mean, there's so many things to tell you about this, but let, let me suffice it to say that I believe it is a universal concept. It's uh, the hallmark of what it means to be human, is that common shared yearning to be treated with dignity, to be treated as if we're something of value. And uh, as I said earlier, when we're not, all, all sorts of horrible things happen when we perceive that we're not being treated with dignity, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in our families, whether it's in uh, our international relations. This is the, the common denominator. So what does it mean? What does it look like um, to honor dignity? I'm going to give you 10 ways that I, one of my researchers has shown that there are 10 ways that people universally want to be treated with dignity. And first of all, they, people want their identity accepted, no matter who they are. They don't want to be treated as, um, you know, in a biased or discriminatory way. We all want our identity accepted. We want recognition, recognition of our unique qualities and ways of life. We want acknowledgment, and especially we want acknowledgment when we've suffered. And we also want acknowledgment when we've done something really wonderful. So human beings crave that, that, um, that sense that somebody else out there is seeing and acknowledging who I am, what I'm doing, and what I'm about. <laughs> Inclusion, well, in a workplace, in all, uh, I, in all organizations, actually, people want to feel a sense that they belong. And if you don't, if you feel like you're on the margins of that, if you feel like you're being left out of that sense of belonging, it's a terrible place. And people feel like it's a violation of their dignity. Safety, oh, here's the big one for the corporate world, folks. Um, we all understand that we need to feel physically safe. That's nothing new, right? We have a legal system that protects us against uh, being physically harmed. We have a whole healthcare system that takes care of us. But safety, psychologically, when we feel that we, our dignity is being uh, compromised, when we feel that more psychological, deeply spiritual sense of who we are is being violated, we end up feeling shamed and humiliated. That's the kind of safety I'm really focusing on here. And also the safety to feel, to feel safe enough to speak up when something bad is happening to us in our environment. And by the way, when I've done all my corporate work, this is the key element that people complain about. They do not feel safe to speak up, especially to their bosses, when their dignity is being violated. Independence, well, that's freedom. We all want a sense of freedom. We don't want to be micromanaged. We don't want to be, our, uh, to be restricted in any way. We want to be understood. So understanding is a key element. And I can tell you from working in the conflict world for so, as long as I have, most, one of the, almost all the time, both parties and both sides of the conflicts never feel adequately understood. Uh, benefit of the doubt. This is the ninth element of dignity, benefit of the doubt. We all want to be treated and approached as if we were people of integrity. And giving people the benefit of the doubt is a, actually a way of saying, yes, I'm going to start out and I emphasize start out because people always say to me, well, what if you know the person isn't really trustworthy? What are you going to do? But benefit of the doubt is a way of initially showing that person that you think that he uh, or she is uh, worthy of trust. Now, this is, this is where the trust comes into this uh, conversation here. Because when p people feel that these elements of dignity, and I've got one more, but I want, want to stick with benefit of the doubt because this is where trust is lives in my model. When people feel that these other elements of dignity are being violated, the instant we even have a, even a certain look or a tone of voice can trigger a dignity violation, then trust breaks down. It's the first uh, reaction, not only do, peop do 
tr does trust break down? But secondly, it creates resentment when people feel that they've been dishonored, right? So trust, and I think trust and resentment go hand in hand here because it's the, it's the part that prevents people from, stay, from being in a relationship in a healthy way or in an organization in a healthy way. And finally, last but not least, um, the last element of dignity is um, the desire to be apologized to when someone has done us harm. But I don't know if you're anything like me, sometimes giving an apology is one of the hardest things, even if you know you're wrong, right? It's really hard. So I'm not saying any of these things is easy. They are all very, very difficult. But um, the other thing that we have to understand about this is that I was just at a conference just uh, in um, Notre Dame where it was a, um, a group of uh, people interested in human development. And the thing is that we grow and flourish in the context of relationships. That's where our development happens. And if our relationships are not relationships that are mutually honoring, that understand these significant um, elements of dignity and all how we are all, every human being yearns to have these 10 elements honored in them. And if they don't, relationships break down in a nanosecond. And keep in mind, but relationships actually are the source and the, the context of our development. So we better get this right. You know, we better, if we want good relationships, and in the workplace, in the workplace, I actually believe that we, we spend so much time in the workplace, and it should be an environment that promotes, not only protects, but promotes human dignity, because dignity is the stuff of, of human development. It is what makes human development flourish and happen. We don't have a sense of well-being unless um, we have our dignity intact. And uh, in fact, the other day I was looking at that there was this International Happiness Day, and I'm thinking, you know what? We need to have an International Dignity Day, mm -hmm. because there is no happiness without a sense of dignity, mm -hmm. without the sense that you're being treated well, without an internal sense of your own well-being. You can't, you know. So let's let's let's. Okay, ne where's Michael? We're going or Matt Manuel. We're going to do this next year, right? <laughs> International <laughs> Dignity Day. Okay, so one three things I want to tell you about develop uh, about dignity. It's about connection connection and connection. It's about connection to our own sense of self-worth, which is fundamental. The minute we lose that connection to our self-worth, we're in trouble. All sorts of morbid symptoms appear after that. Connection to the dignity of other people. And thirdly, as it relates to your question about the common good, thirdly, it's a connection of something greater than ourselves. And I think dignity has those three dimensions that are constantly interacting with us uh, as we go throughout our lives. And I think the workplace and humanistic management paradigm really, talk, uh, really sheds light on this. The workplace is the place where um, this connection to a shared purpose can be played out. And it, maybe it's not even the common good. Maybe it's just the shared purpose of what this organization all uh, agrees to um, aspire uh, to withhold, what, whatever the purpose is. But I'd like, uh, Rita, could you give them the handouts? Because I know I'm, I'm um, running out of time. But here's what I, and again, I'm hoping all the work that I've done in the last 10 years is about making this dignity uh, work accessible and practical and useful. And I've developed for organizations something called a dignity code of ethics, which I just want to leave you with, all right? Because I, uh, I'm, you know, I, I tend so often to go, off into the clouds thinking abstractly about dignity, but I want to give you something concrete. Can I just see the, the, yeah, okay, here we go. Oh yeah, well, let's see, yours is less like that. Okay, so quick, very, very quickly. This is, a, this is a dignity code that I work with people in organizations when we're trying to promote a culture of dignity. When the leadership, and here's the, the key element here, when the leadership has decided that they want to integrate this dignity, knowledge, and understanding into their culture, okay? So what are the things that matter? Dignity matters. Um, we're a company that recognizes the importance of treating our employees and customers in a way that honors their value and worth and the significant role they play in the organization. Identity matters. We want our employees and customers to be proud to be a part of an organization that puts recognition of their value and worth at the center of their brand and image. Leadership matters. 
We're a company whose leaders aspire to lead with dignity and promote an organizational culture of learning through self-reflection and accountability. Because there's nothing worse when your leaders don't take responsibility for ways in which they've violated the dignity of the employees. Find, uh, and, uh, people matter. We're a company whose employees aspire to treat each other with dignity and to promote an organizational culture of learning, both, same thing, with, as leaders, through self-reflection and accountability. Relationships matter. We're a company that wants strong connection with all of our work groups and are committed to building those relationships on a foundation of dignity. The workplace matters. We're a company that people want to work for and where they enjoy their jobs and each other. We strive to make the work environment one where people feel free to speak up and be heard without fear of recrimination. And finally, I, I really think this is one of the critical pieces of establishing a culture of dignity, because the fact is we're going to mess up. Even if we have dignity consciousness, because we're human beings, we're going we're to get lost every now and then, and we're going to end up violating people's dignity. We are a company that recognizes that conflict is a normal occurrence and is a useful signal of the need for change. We are committed to establishing dialogue processes so that conflicts can be managed in a dignified way ensuring that people's concerns are heard and acknowledged, and we recognize that managing conflict and the need for change is key to the company's uh, continued growth and prosperity. That's it. <laughs>